Okay, welcome back, everybody. All right, everybody doing okay? Okay, uh, well, <laughs> let us continue. Any questions before I begin? Okay. No questions? All right, well, let us continue with the chapter five, in which here we are dealing with um, the electron configuration of electrons, okay? Now, as let me back up a little bit just to remember, refresh your memory. We had uh, the model where we had the nucleus with the protons and the neutrons, and then we had the electrons someplace around in the atom. Okay, uh, experimentation and of uh, looking at elements that were exposed to energy, which emitted light. We broke up the light. Uh, that light has distinct energy. Uh, and therefore, from that information, we brought it down to the idea that electrons exist in specific energy levels, okay? Specifically, seven energy levels, which is along the lines with the seven periods of the periodic table, okay? And then there were subatomic levels, which were orbits, which are the S, the P, the D, and the F, okay? Now... Which brings me to a point here real quick before I forget. Um, occasionally you, you come across information uh, like, let me share the whiteboard here. But there's a question may be asked, okay, can anybody tell me how many, what is the total number of electrons in the, let's say the second energy level? Okay, so let me write that down. Total number of electrons capable of being in, I'm gonna write, uh, uh, being, total number of electrons available in the Second energy le level. Okay, which is another way of saying, okay, second energy level from the periodic table. What is the total number of electrons that I can put on that second energy level? Second energy level. Okay. What to answer that? You first have to figure out, well, how many orbits are in the second energy level? If you recall, in the first energy level, there's only one orbit, and that is the S. So in the first energy level, the maximum number of electrons, max electrons, would be two. Okay, because each orbit, there's only one S orbit can handle two electrons. All right, for the second energy level, which is denoted by the coefficient s, which tells us the second energy level, that has two orbits. We have the s and the p. Okay. All right, so we know that the s can handle a maximum of two electrons, right? And in the p, there are three orbits in the p. Each can handle two electrons, so that's a total of six. So six plus two means that in the second energy level, the maximum number of electrons that we can put in the second energy level is eight. What about the third? Okay. The third, we have the three S again. We have the three P again. But remember, we introduced the D, the delta level in orbits. Okay. So how many, what is the maximum number of electrons can I put in the third energy level. Anybody have an idea? Typical cut type of question you may be asked. FYI. Okay. How many, how many, how many electrons 
can you put maximum in the third energy level? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Give us some thought. How many in yes? Or a bit? Let me erase that here. Why well, I don't know why you put a P2 up there. Okay. We have, uh, let me draw this a little bit better. Like I told you, my little pin resolution really is not the best. So we got the 3S, the 3P, and the 3D orbits in the third energy level. The S can handle two max, right? The P can handle six max. What about the D? Two for the S, six for the P. What is the maximum number of electrons that the D orbit can handle? If you forget, where can you find that information when I having to dig through your notes? Is it 10? You got it, 10. Because remember that the, the electrons, I said those ones in the center had 10 columns. I said, think of those as the D electrons, right? 10 columns. The first column had two, two columns, okay? Exactly, Jennifer, is 10. Think of those two for the S, S1, S2. And then the P had six columns. And so maximum number of electrons that you can put in in the third energy level will be 18. Okay, now you can figure this one for yourself and see how many was the max for the fourth energy level. Okay. Now, give that some thought. Okay. Now, don't confuse this question with questions like, what is the maximum number of electrons you can put in the P or in the P orbits? Okay. In the P orbits, like we just talked about, the P orbits, there's three of them, two for each one. So, total is six. What about the D? Ten, because there's five orbits of the ten. And how many is the maximum for the F? 14, okay, because there's seven orbits, each can handle two, okay? So there's a difference, read the question carefully, are we talking about the specific orbit or are we talking about a specific energy level? One, two, three, four, et cetera, all right? Okay, so the electron configuration is a means by which we can uh, demonstrate and show where the electrons are. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, the most important one, is gonna demonstrate to you where these electrons exist and demonstrate how the magical octet is obtained by these elements. These elements, with the exception of helium, which has a magical duet. And, you know, hydrogen and helium want to go for a duet, two electrons. But everybody else is trying to maintain eight electrons around the valence shell. Okay? And that's what this, um, we can show that by showing the electron configuration. So, you draw the electron configuration for sodium. We know that sodium, if you just, now, again, my emphasis is using the periodic table to figure out the electron configuration. Now, you want to use a sequence, that's totally up to you, whatever works for you, all right? I just, I, I like to use a periodic table because I know sodium's right there, okay? It is in the third energy level, one, two, three, it is in the first column of the S electrons. And so being in the third energy level, okay, and the first column, which means there's only one valence electrons, I'm already, I just wrote the electron configuration for the valence shell right there, just by finding it on the periodic table. That means that everything before it, the one and the two, is it, they're maxed out, right? All right, so we go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and bam, you're done. Okay. And that's using the periodic table and its position on the periodic table to determine the electron configuration. So we go 1s2 is full, 2s2 is full, and 2p6 is full. Okay. 
we know that it's in the third energy level, okay? And therefore, uh, it's one electron is in the S1. So it's three S1, telling you that that valence electron is in the third energy level in the suborbit S or orbit S, and that one superscript one tells you there's one. That's oxygen. Well, let's, let's utilize the uh, uh, product table, find it. And the product table, oxygen's right there, okay? So it's in the second energy level. And so it's going across the product table. So the S electrons are full. And then we find that the oxygen is in the fourth column, fourth column of the P elements, okay? It's in group uh, six, which tells you how many in the valence electrons, but it's in the fourth column in the P electrons. And being that it is in the second energy level, I can very quickly write uh, 2s2, 2p4. There's the valence shell. Okay, and the second energy level, well, so it's just simply 1s2 because the first energy level was full. Cool. All right, so it is in group Roman numeral six, which tells us that there are six valence electrons for oxygen. And of those six, two of them occupy the S orbit in the second energy level, and the other four occupy the are occupied in the P orbit of the second energy level, okay? Note that that P orbit only has four. It has room for two more. Okay, it has a total of six valence electrons and it's striving for that magical eight. So it's easier from an energy perspective to gain two electrons to fill up those two empty orbits in the P than it is to try to get rid of six electrons. It takes energy to get rid of six. Yeah, not so much as you, we fill it in. And so uh, once it does that, it picks up two electrons and now has oxygen, now has a negative one charge. We'll get more to that in, in a bit. Okay. Whereas up here, sodium, you know, it's got one little, oops, what happened here? Sodium has uh, one valence electrons sitting there all by itself out there just hanging out in the third energy level. Now, to be stable, it's trying to get that magical eight. And so again, ask yourself, is it energy favorable to gain seven electrons with a negative charge and put it into sodium or just simply get rid of one? And sure enough, it is easier to get rid of one. And now the next valence shell is the one in and now it's more stable, and now has six, eight electrons in the outermost shell, the new outermost shell, which created a, an, an ion, okay, by losing electrons, whereas oxygen we were doing also created an ion, but it created a negative ion because it had, it gained two electrons. And in both cases, the, the losing of electrons and the gaining of electrons the next valence shell, be it the next one in or filling it, filling in the one it's in, now has eight. And that's the stability factor for those elements. Okay, cleared up. Let's go. Oxygen, we just did that. Okay. Calcium, like sodium, is in the second energy level. Oh, excuse me, fourth energy level. Okay, and it's in the second column of the S elements. So that would be 4S2. And then everything else, that's the beta shell, the outermost shell. And then everything else is filled in. Okay, chlorine, like oxygen. Oh, there's a 4S2, the outermost shell. Chlorine, like oxygen, okay, is 
has is not like similar to oxygen is it has is the fifth column of the piece. So that is the outermost shower is a three p five. Okay, it has seven electrons in the outermost shell in the third energy level. Of those seven, two of them are in the S, five of them are in the P. Now, P can carry, the P orbit can have one more, right? Because you can get a maximum of six in the Ps. So chlorine will gain one electron rather than lose those seven. It will gain one electron and now has eight, which is a lot more stable than hanging out with with the seven in the valence shell okay all right those are the electron configurations which again tell you about where the electrons are what orbit they're in i tend to favor using the periodic table and its position the elements position on the periodic table to help me generate the electron configuration and a turn to or a turn to use that sequence that is given to you a few slides back whatever works for you Okay, which I show here. Notice there's that sequence. Okay, but if you're using the product table, notice notice the electron configuration for the element at whatever, whichever element you're looking at here. Okay, and so um, remember these are the the D's. And there's the S, and these are the, the F elements and the P elements. Now, obviously, here you notice that it's not sequential, one, two, three, four, five, but four, four chem 130. If we ever get into the Ds, just sequentially, one through 10, whatever the case may be. Okay, so if you're if it's this guy here, it would be D one, two, three, four. This would be D four, etc. Same is true for the S. Sequentially, S one through fourteen. And then uh, look at this element right here, which would be lithium, right? Lithium would be two S two, the outermost shell, and then the rest of it would be one S two because it has three total electrons. So this particular table here helps you out with respect to uh, writing the electron co configuration for each element. Notice that the green, notice the green, which are the nonmetals, okay, and the which would be all these guys here, okay. Notice that they're they're not well, with the exception of carbon. Let's go from here. The green exception of carbon. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're very close to getting that eight by gaining electrons like 3P3. Very readily can easily pick up three more electrons. The reason I say about P4, these guys, okay, they have four valence electrons. And the magical number is eight, trying to get that eight. And when you're on at the four, you're on the fence. So you have a choice here that can happen. You can gain four or lose four. You're on the fence there. And, and depending on the reaction conditions, you can gain or lose four. Once you're past that, it's all these guys in here. They tend to want to gain electrons. Okay, they're non-metal because they want to be like the noble gas that's in front of it, has eight electrons around it. They got that got a little messy there. Okay. All right. So, as I stated, noble gases. That's a very group eight, very stable, and very happy for 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 an element, right? Their s and their p orbits are full. Okay, and they have eight electrons on the outermost shell, with the exception of helium. It just has two. All right. So that's a two, a one s two, and. Uh, I introduced the term valence electrons. It simply is the electrons in the outermost level, the outermost level, because that's, again, that is where all the actions happen. The core electrons are what's inside, inside the valence electrons. So, for example, if we look at phosphorus here, phosphorus has the electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s2, 3s2. P3, okay? And so 
And the valence electrons are these guys right here. That's where all the action is going on. So all the chemistry is occurring right there. Notice something about this. 3s2, 3p6. That p electron, excuse me, that p orbit can handle three more. Phosphorus is a nonmetal. Find its position in, in uh, one, two, three. Phosphorus is right there. Okay, it is a nonmetal. And it is because it's so close to the noble gas in front of it, it will pick up three electrons. Okay, it will pick them up and put them right in there, and that fills up that valence shell. Now you got eight. Plus, what happens is P neutral now becomes. P minus three, because it picked up three electrons, and that is the ion. All right. Okay, how many valence electrons for, let's say, chlorine? Find chlorine on a periodic table, you'll find it to be in group seven. So there are seven valence electrons, and there's the electron configuration given there, okay? And that would be the valence electrons are in the th third energy level. There's seven, very close to eight. And so chlorine has a tendency to gain electrons. Remember I said all nonmetals gain electrons. And they do that because they want that octet orbit to be full, the outermost shell, the valence shell to be full. Beryllium, there's two valence electrons. It is in group two. You go to the uh, periodic table, find it. It's in group 2A. That tells you it, it, is, it has two valence electrons, which are in the second energy level, okay? Beryllium is the metal. It tends to want to lose electrons, and specifically, it is going to lose those in the outermost shell, those two sitting there now have the electron configuration like helium or 1s2. And then aluminum, aluminum is in group Roman numeral 3a, and it has three valence electrons. Those three are in the third energy level right here. Two of them are in the s orbit, and one of them is in the uh, p orbit. Aluminum is a metal. And as I stated before, metals lose electrons. And when it does that, it's going to lose those three specifically. Because now the next valence shell in is full. And now aluminum, by losing those three electrons, will end up with a plus three charge. Okay, because it lost three electrons. Again, the driving force is trying to maintain the octet by some means, by either gaining electrons or losing electrons. And so here you can use a periodic table to help you if you ever ask a question. Now this pertains to only those elements, the A elements, does not pertain to the B. The B, which are the 10 columns inside the periodic table. Okay, let's go to this. Okay, these are the inside ones here, the Bs. We're going to learn that these guys in here, we cannot predict what their charge will be when they lose electrons. Okay, the only ones we can are the ones, the A elements, groups one through seven. Eight, eight, nothing's going to happen to eight. Those are noble gases. They, they're stable. So with that information, we can look at any of the elements. Uh, oh, what happened? Where did it go? And if you're asked for any element and you look for it and determine first, is it one of the elements? If it is, then you can determine just by its position, okay, how many valence electrons they have. If it's a B, you cannot determine that. It varies. All right, and so you can see across the table from 1A all the way across to 8A, that's the number that represents the number of valence electrons. 
which is consistent when we think about it. Earlier I said to you the group four, which is this guy here. Okay. The metal, if the elements in group four, they're on the fence from the magical eight number. Okay. They're on the fence. So two things can happen, one or the other. It's going to either gain four electrons because this is just as energetically favorable as losing four. Carbon can lose four, carbon can lose four, or gain it four, depends on the conditions. After that, when we go in this direction, for the nonmetals, they're going to gain electrons because by gaining electrons, they're going to fill up that magical eight. And so group five will pick up three electrons. Group six will pick up two electrons. Group seven will pick up how many? At one electron. Okay. And group eight, not going to pick up anything. Remember, in noble gases, nothing happens there. Okay. And so group five, six, and seven, they're going to gain electrons. The result is the element goes from a net zero charge to either a net three charge, negative three, negative two, or a negative one charge ion. The ion is, are the elements that either gain or lost electrons. On the other end, these guys are metals, okay? So they're going to lose three electrons for the 3A. The 2A, they're going to lose two electrons for the 2A metals, and they're going to lose one electron for the 1A metals, resulting in a positive three charge, positive two charge and a positive one charge respectively. Over here would be a negative overall new negative three charge, negative two charge and negative one charge for the ions that are created from the elements, okay? And the, the group 4A, it just depends, okay? Depends on the reaction conditions. Not only does that tell you how many electrons you're going to lose, it's also going to tell you how many bonds can be formed specifically for the um, uh, uh, nonmetals over here, starting group five. We just talked about how many electrons they will gain, but that information also says the maximum number of bonds at group five elements will be three. Three bonds. So, for example, nitrogen can only make three bonds like that. Okay. Uh, in group six, they're going to make two bonds. So, something like oxygen can make two bonds, H2O. And in group, group seven, they're only going to make one bond. So knowing the group it's in on the periodic table, it will tell you how many electrons, first of all, how many valence electrons it has. Then from that information, it will tell you how many electrons it will gain to become an ion. And additional to that number, it's going to tell you how many maximum bonds that particular element can make, okay? Just simply for knowing its position on the periodic table. Yes, you can... Sit, memorize all the properties for nitrogen, oxygen, that's fine. But, you know, you can also just analyze the data, the data the periodic table, and come up with an answer. Okay. All right, let's clear this up. So, how many valence electrons? We go, go look for it. SR strontium is in group 2A, so it will have two valence electrons, okay? Br, which is bromine, is in group 7A, so it has seven valence electrons. Argon, which is a noble gas, is in group 8, will have eight valence electrons. Remember, the, the noble gas is the last column on your right. 
do not react because the, the, the valence electrons are there, all eight of them, <laughs> and therefore no more reactivity. And in silicon, it's in group four like carbon. So silicon now has four valence electrons and then sulfur has six, okay? So this is an exercise, this one is an exercise of simply finding its position, looking at the group number it's in, that's called the group number, the, valent, the uh, uh, Roman numeral number, and that tells you how many valence electrons, okay? And so, <clears throat> As I mentioned here, the question here, I, I mentioned this earlier, so why do atoms make bonds? And, and the driving force of making bonds is trying to obtain an octet around its environment, around its valence channel. Okay, some, and that's the majority of compounds, but some compounds like hydrogen, they only want to obtain um, around it. So that's the thing to remember. Hydrogen will only have one bond around it. It won't have any, any more, okay? Because only, it only needs two electrons. Its octet rule is really a duet rule. I've already introduced this, this thing about ion formation, and again, I can't, I can't over, over, overemphasize it. Ion for formation is simply nothing more than losing or gaining electrons, okay? I touched on this and I'll show it to you again. Here's the electron configuration for sodium. One is two, two is two, two P6, okay? Three S1. The valence shell is in the third energy level. It has one, one um, uh, electron in the valence shell. Now, in the third energy level, like we talked about earlier, you have a maximum of, you know, how many electrons they said we can put in there? Wasn't that 18? Okay, 18 electrons. So uh, the question here, okay, do we add 17 more electrons to sodium? <laughs> well, uh, the, the probability of that is pretty low in, from an energy pr perspective. So it's much easier from an energy perspective to get rid of that one sitting there by itself, okay? And now it becomes a more stable uh, moiety, specifically an ion, okay? Now, why does it have a plus one charge to refresh your memory? When it's an element, there's 11 protons and 11 electrons, neutral charge. But it loses one electron, now it has 11 protons and 10 electrons. Okay, so think of it this way. I got, you got $11 and you spend $10. Hey, yeah, you're still good with one, $1 left, right? You're in the plus, you got $1 left. Okay, because the protons have a positive charge, the electrons have a negative charge, right? And so 11 to 10 gives you a net plus one. Let's take a look at sulfur. Okay, now, if we look at the electron, before I proceed, if we look at the electron configuration of uh, the sodium ion, what other element has 10 electrons? Which, which element has 10 electrons? There's only one element. Is it neon? You got it. Neon, this has this is the same electron configuration of neon. And neon is a noble gas, right? Group A. And so sodium element, sodium atom by losing this valence electron now becomes a lot more stable because now the new valence shell is full, like neon. We have a term for this, it'll come up, but we call that isoelectronic. Now, this is the important part. Electronic, I gotta learn how to spell here. Okay, electronic. 
Here's the important part. Don't mistake what I just said, okay? I did say that sodium became neon, okay? What I said was sodium became isoelectronic as neon. They share the same number of electrons. If sodium became neon, they sodium would have to lose what? A proton, right? They didn't lose a proton. They just, and that's way back when I said you can lose neutrons and electrons and gain them, lose or gain all day long, no problem. You still have that element. All right, so that's the driving force. Sodium became isoelectronic like neon. Okay, now let's take a look at sulfur. Sulfur has this electron configuration. Okay. And in its outermost shell, it's in group seven, it has six valence electrons. And sulfur is a non-metal. Remember I said, put this in long-term memory, metals, metals lose electrons. Sodium is a metal, it will lose electrons. Sulfur is a non-metal, it will gain electrons. Because if you look at the position of the non-metals, guess what? They're very close to the noble gases. And so it's easier for them to become more stable by gaining the electrons and therefore being isoelectronic with the noble gas in front of it. Sodium is isoelectronic with the noble gas behind it, right? Because sodium, neon is behind it, if you will. Sodium is number 11. Neon's number 10, okay? And so uh, <coughs> sulfur will have a tendency to gain specifically two electrons. And specifically, we now have a negative two charge because in, in, early, in the beginning, at 16 protons, 16 electrons. Now it still has 16 protons, but it picked up two electrons, 18 electrons now. It now has an overall negative charge, okay? Another thing to remember here is when the nonmetals become ions, we change the name. So this is sulfur to begin with. And now when it becomes an ion, it becomes, we get rid of the er, and we add the IDE, sulfide. So there is a difference in the name between sulfur and sulfide. The metals don't change the name. You either say the sodium element or atom or the sodium ion, that's it. But distinctly, uh, the nonmetals have a full name change. All right, so below sulfur or above sulfur is oxygen extrapolate from here extend what you learn about sulfur okay and just look at oxygen which is right above it okay is how many electrons do you anticipate oxygen to gain or lose first of all do you expe expect oxygen to gain or lose electrons you can answer gain it's a non-metal remember non-metal Okay, go to number one. Number two question, how many electrons do you think it's going to gain? Well, based on what we just talked about, sulfur, find sulfur, find oxygen, see where they're at relative to each other. And can I, we, can't we just take the same information we just learned about sulfur and apply it to oxygen? Sure, why? They're in the same group. So they would both be two then, right? You got it. In fact, oxygen will now become a negative two also like sulfur, okay? By gaining two electrons. And what else? Its name becomes, anybody want to take a shot of the new name of the ion of oxygen? Oxide? If so, oxide, you got it, good job. Okay, so when oxygen gain electron, 
it becomes oxide. Let me tell you another one. It extrapolates. Bromine. It's going to get an electron. It's going to gain one electron. What do you think its new name would be? Bromide. Bromide. You got it. Okay. All the nonmetals, the single elements, by gaining electrons, change their name to the IDE, which is going to be different for like, like we got sulfide down the road, the polyatomic ions. You may have saw in that table we talked about briefly, you may have seen sulfate and sulfite, the eight and the eight. So you got IDE, which is a single sulfur. But when you see the ATE, eight and eight, sulfite, that is sulfur with oxygen bonded with it. There's a sulfate with a negative two, and there is a sulfite with a negative two. The only difference is one less oxygen. Anyway, introduction to the names here, okay? And so now we can start naming compounds. So you got sodium sulfide, okay, potassium sulfide, okay, so on and so forth. All right. Uh, let me see. Let me clear. All right. Give me two minutes. Be right back.
Uh, I, I'm back. Thank you. I needed to do something. <laughs> Where do you go? I'm right here. <laughs> Took a short nap. <laughs> All right. Um, and so we were talking about the ion formation. Okay. The ions are coming from the atoms, and the ions is a general term for these elements that either gain or lose electrons. They're going to have a specific term in a little bit here. Okay, so you hope you can see what the driving force is here by losing and gaining electrons, what happens. That when a metal loses an electron, the new valence shell is full. Now, I want you to think about this for a second, okay? What does your intuition tell you about the diameter of the metal or the, or the sodium Okay, it's got the third energy level for with one valence electron, and it loses this. What do you think happens to the ion diameter? So the question is, who do you think is bigger, the sodium atom or the sodium ion? What does your intuition tell you? Is which one be bigger? The ion. Exactly, the ion would be would be bigger, okay? And you might say, well, why is that? I mean, really think think about it again. Is that here we have its outermost shell is in the third energy level? It's, it's this size. When it loses that electron out there. The new valence shell now goes to the second energy level. So now it's shrunk. And so the ion is smaller than the actual element. Okay. Now give us some thought about the sulfur and the sulfide. What would you anticipate to be bigger in diameter, the atom or the ion of sulfur? Yeah, 50% chance, 50-50 chance, right? It's either get bigger or smaller. Think about it. What What is happening, okay? Because now you got room for two electrons and you add the atom there. What do you think is going to happen to that P orbit by adding two electrons? Plus, they got a negative charge. And I got six negatives in the same orbit, you know, bouncing up against each other, so to speak. They're going to repel, okay, because they're negative. So those eight electrons, six of them in the P, two of them in the S, are going to repel each other. So the result is that the ion gets bigger for the metal, the nonmetals that gain electrons. For those atoms that gain electrons, the ion gets bigger compared to those elements, elements that lose electrons, the ions get smaller, okay? All right. So here we're writing the electron configuration. Now, be careful when you see this, okay? When you look at the question, you know, you might mistake it and say, oh, they're asking you for potassium. Well, no, they're not asking you for potassium because if they were, they'd be writing just K, right? But they're writing it with K plus one, which means that they're asking for the potassium ion, all right? And so you can do it one or two ways. You can write it for the for the um, uh, the element, the atom, and then take off the electron. You can do it that way, okay? Because let me write it out. For the, for the element itself it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 2, excuse me, 3p6, 4s1, right? There you go for the element. And then by losing that 4s1, it becomes 3s2, 3p6, it's the ion, and now it's isoelectronic with argon. They share the same number of electrons. Nitrogen is a nonmetal. It is in group five. 
it will gain three electrons, okay? Because normally it is one, uh, two, the valence charge is 2s2, 2p3, and picks up three electrons, now has an overall negative charge, and now it's isoelectronic with neon. And then magnesium, normally it's in group two, A, Okay, it's in the third energy level. Normally, magnesium is the outermost shell is 3s2. Okay, but it's a non-metal. It's going to lose its electrons. And now its new valence shell is a 2s2, 2p6. So notice something. Notice that the nitro. Oh, oh, I said the name, but who can tell me? Who wants to take take a take a shot at the new name for nitrogen? Okay, we had N, which is nitrogen. Okay, and based on what I talked about earlier, what do you think the na new name is for the ion? We'd like to take a shot at that. Remember the sulfide? What do you think nitrogen now, its new name is? How about... Night. Nice. Nice. You got it. You got the night. One more. Give it one more. I heard the night tried. Just like the sulfide, the if this is phosphorus, that become phosphide. Chlor fluorine became fluoride. Chlorine became chloride. Nitrogen becomes nitride. Okay. Phosphorus below it will be phosphide. Okay, so the nitride ion and the magnesium ion, totally different elements, what they share now as ions is they share the same electron configuration as neon, which is given by this electron configuration. They both share the same electron configuration. They're not the, each other's element. They're just sharing the number of electrons now. Now they're nice, nice and stable now because they have the magical eight number. Little octet room. All right, so group one A, they all want to be, you know, group one A, these are the, these are the metals. They all gonna lose electrons. So they're gonna have a plus one charge because they have a valence electron. One valence electron, that's a 1A group. Everybody, that is why they they put them in that group together because all of them share this, they have the same property of having one valence electron, okay? 2A, two valence electrons, therefore we lose two electrons. They want to lose two electrons, they end up with a positive two charge, okay? And the group 3A metals will want to lose um, three electrons to become the plus three ions, okay? Now, what does this tell you? Well, let me finish with this and I'm gonna show you that periodic table that I have here. Group 7A, by gaining one electron, they are now have the same number of noble gas, uh, same number of electrons as the noble gas in front of it. So they end up with a negative with charge, okay? Like chloride. You know, and then uh, group six, gain two electrons, like we talked about oxygen, now becomes oxide. Notice the name, the name change. Chlorine became chloride. Oxygen become oxide. All right. Uh, Nonmetals, they want to gain electrons. You know, it de uh, depends on the conditions, but we will focus mostly on the metals and the non-metals because the not the uh, uh, this metalloids. Excuse me, I meant to say the metalloids. It depends on the conditions. So, non-metals want to gain electrons, like I said before. Metals want to lose electrons, and that's all we're going to worry about: the non-metals and the metals. So they become negative in charge, or here's their special name. They become anions. Anions are nonmetals that have gained electrons. 
be, to become ions. Okay, so group seven A, like I stated, negative one charge, so on and so forth. Negative three for five A, five A, negative two for two, uh, negative two for uh, Roman numeral six A. And this metals, long term memory. Lose electrons. So you might say, well, who are the metals? I refer you back to that slide that was that broke it down for you. Who were the non-metals? Who were the metals? Okay. And we we talked about we have already kind of killed it a little bit, but uh, uh, cations have a plus charge for group one. Non-metals gain electrons, end up with a negative. Okay. Cations is a special name for the metals that gain electrons. Right here, cations, anions, or the nonmetals that have a negative charge. One way, I don't know, what helps me, what helped me way back when was uh, I, I saw the N of anions is negative, so that reminded me that those are negative charge ions. Okay which means that cations were positive. We will learn that when you start making compounds, specific compounds, it is the cation and the anion that come together to make a compound. It's the negative and the positive that come together to make a compound here. All right, let me turn this up a little bit. Uh, the group 4A, as I mentioned, they can vary depends on conditions. So carbon, everybody in group 4A, they're on the fence. They can gain or lose electrons. And we know about the group A, nothing's going to happen to them. They're not going to do anything because their they're, they're octet is fulfilled. Helium is a duet. Remember that. Okay. So if you look at the periodic table, for the, the A elements, you can see the charges, the, per, the corresponding charges that occur across the periodic table from left to zero, okay? All right. So, once we know that from the periodic table, we can determine what kind of charge they're going to have, right? First of all, you know all the metals, you know, if you get a list like this, the first thing I would do is I would say, okay, let, let me find all the metals. Well, we know lithium is a metal, magnesium is a metal, aluminum is a metal. So those guys are going to have a positive, 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 positive. Don't know the magnitude yet, right? I'm just going through it systematically, right? I tell you. All right, then we got the nonmetals. Well, that's going to be sulfur. What's left? Bromine and oxygen. Being nonmetals, I know they're going to have negative charges. A magnitude, don't know yet, but once I find them on their product table, that will tell me what group they're in. It'll tell me what charge it is. And so once I identify the metals, identify the nonmetals, next thing is to identify them on the product table, determine what group they're in, and that tells me what the corresponding negative or positive charge they may have when they become ions. So lithium is a metal. It is in group one. So it will have a plus one charge, okay? Magnesium, it's a group two A metal. It has a positive charge. Specifically, it will have a positive two charge because it is a two, uh, group two A uh, metal, which means two valence electrons, okay? Sulfur, we, we just determined, is a non-metal. So it will have a negative. Find it on the periodic table. It has a group, it is in group seven, excuse me, group five. Excuse me, excuse me again, group six. So it will lose, gain two electrons. So it will have a negative two charge, okay? Bromine. Sorry, I was looking at sulfur and thinking bromine because bromine is in group seven, okay? It's a non-metal. Being group seven, it's going to have a negative one charge when it becomes an ion. Nitrogen, group five, okay? It becomes 
a negative one three charge. Now, somebody, someone asked me, does it make a difference where I put a two plus or a plus two? It makes no difference whatsoever. It's the same thing. Same is true. Is it two negative or negative two? Same thing. Okay, nitrogen and negative uh, three. And then finally, aluminum is a metal. It's in group 3A. Therefore, it will have a plus three charge. Now, of these here, names change. So going from sulfur, it becomes sulfide. Bromine became a bromide. Hydrogen became nitride. Lithium stays lithium, but now we just call it the lithium ion, magnesium ion, and the aluminum ion. Okay, that's it. They don't change the name other than adding the ion. And so now we're beginning, we're going to start beginning putting molecules together. I can put the lithium, remember, opposites attract. I can only make compounds with positive and negatives here. This is a specific type of compound. We got lithium and sulfur, lithium sulfide, lithium bromide. So I can go lithium sulfide, lithium bromide. And guess what? Lithium nitride. Try the magnesium sulfide, magnesium bromide, magnesium nitride. You can do the same thing with aluminum. We've got aluminum sulfide, aluminum bromide, and aluminum nitride. And that's just the beginning because I haven't introduced, you mean you know now the sodium, the lithium, uh, potassium, you can mix and match. Right now you got a names, you can start putting them together, coming up with a large number of uh, compounds, maybe three, four, five hundred combinations so far. Okay, because we haven't talked about all the anions. You got bromide, but you got the chloride you can put in there, the iodine and the bromide. Uh, we got the bromide, the chloride, so on and so forth. All right, so you're, be you're beginning to put things together here. Okay, so I mentioned the name isoelectronic already. It just means the same number of electrons. And so the magnesium ion is isoelectronic at two neon. Okay. I reintroduce this, and the phosphide is isoelectronic with argon. The important part here is it doesn't say that the phosphide, P negative three, is argon. It says it is isoelectronic. They share the number of electrons only. Okay. And so you may get a table like this electron configuration. They want you to write the electron configuration, and from the looks of it, all of them are ions. Okay, so if it does help you first, write the electron configuration of the element itself, and then make it into a corresponding ion to help you out. And you should come up with that electron configuration for each of these ions. Very important in question. So when you look at the, the question, if they're giving you a subscript charge, you're looking at the ions. What happens occasionally, a lot of times, is the question is write the electron configuration for calcium. And people write, uh, we're at calcium, so it'll be 4s2. They write this for, oh, let me change that color, make it easier to read. 4s2. But that wouldn't be the electron configuration for the ion of calcium. Yes, that would be for calcium element. But they're asking for plus two. So that means those val that valence electron is gone. Okay. Or they may, again, here for oxygen, instead of uh, um, they write four instead of six. Well, no, four would be oxygen, the oxygen gas itself, the element oxygen. So be careful and make sure you're reading the superscript and, and not uh, confusing the element with the ion. Okay. And so you can see that two of these are isoelectronic with argon, that is the calcium ion and the chloride. 
and neon isoelectronic with oxide and aluminum. And here you can mix and match. And now you can make calcium oxide, calcium chloride, or aluminum oxide and aluminum chloride, along with the ones we just did earlier. Okay, uh, something like this. They're asking number of protons, number of electrons, number of neutrons. Uh, that reminds me, if, if for some reason on any of the homework or exams, you don't see the image, please, by all means, shoot me an email. Tell me I don't see the image. I would definitely give you credit. We're still having challenges. Not always. It's popping up here and there where Canvas is not displaying the image properly. So we're trying to figure it out. All right, number of protons, uh, just look at selenium, it has 34 protons, uh, has 34 electrons, and then given the mass number up there of 78 in the first column, we can calculate the number of neutrons, okay? Uh, second column is still selenium, but however, check it, make it carefully, watch it, read it carefully, it's got a negative two charge, okay? And so that means that it gained two electrons. So it still has 34 protons. However, now it gained two electrons. So therefore now has 36 electrons. And it still has the same number of neutrons. We didn't change the isotope, still selenium 78. Look at aluminum 27 in both cases, the last two columns, they're both aluminum. So the number of protons is the same, okay? as the number of neutrons. We haven't done anything to change the num that number. What has changed is the number of electrons. The element aluminum has 13 electrons, has the same number of protons, but uh, being in uh, group 3A, and plus is telling you up there it's a plus three, meaning it lost three electrons. It has now 10 electrons, okay? All right, so you might see typical tables like that. All right, so that, ladies and gentlemen, ends um, uh, chapter five. I want to share very quickly with you uh, this particular table, okay? Uh, uh, no, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for I proceed. Right. Any questions on um, on this chapter five? No, because I got a, a couple more minutes. I can jump into this. Finish finish this chapter up. Well, I'm not finishing that chapter five, but at least get get a few slides into it. All right. But this this one deals with the periodic table. Fairly short chapter. And it's going to be talking about some things that we already really talked about, you know, I kind of throw them in a little early, kind of get you, you know, give you a little taste of it. So when it, now it's going to give you the full, the full enchilada, so to speak. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about the periodic table and there and how it, there is some what's called periodicity, hence the term period, periodic table. You already have learning here that with respect to the elements in the same group, uh, they, because they have similar number of the uh, same, not similar, same number of, of uh, valence electrons, they would exhibit similar properties, okay? Because they have the same number of valence electrons. Now, how far back does this periodic table go? Well, it goes quite a bit, 1869. Here's a picture of this crazy scientist. Here's a Russian scientist, uh, Dmitry Mendeleev. He is uh, credited with arranging the elements, having creating the very first element, uh, periodic table, okay? Keep in mind, 1869, not a lot of, quote, scientific equipment, so to speak. And so his arrangement is based on observation, you know, observation skills and so forth of reactions that he did. And he noticed some, some similarity of why certain things reacted very similar. So he arranged them 
in in same same column, similar reactivity, same column. No idea about valence shell and valence electrons. Eighteen sixty nine. Remember, nineteen hundreds is when we're starting to pick up our model and, and what the elements are all about. Okay. Thing about his his first periodic table is there was a lot of um, uh, blanks, a lot of blanks. But it opened up the idea that you know he predicted that there should be elements in based on what was existed at the time. There should be some missing elements, and sure enough, uh, uh, scientists went for a search and started finding these these missing elements based on Dimitri's periodic table. Okay, it wasn't until many years later. I don't have specific time, but uh, Moseley. What he did, he just rearranged the periodic table based on the atomic number as our model came into play and and started assigning atomic numbers and so forth. So he had this thing called the periodic law. Elements in the same column have similar properties. And now we know why, because they share the same number of valence electrons and therefore would exhibit the same similar reactivity. I had mentioned to you earlier that uh, these the F elements down here at the bottom, they have their own little name. We'll give them to, show them to you here in a bit. But normally they would go inside this table, but it, they're brought out and they shrunk. But if you were to put them back in where they belong, this is what the periodic table would look like. This is the long periodic table. So what they've done is actually take the green guys out lanthanide and actinide take them out and they shrunk the periodic table. There's been uh, different types of periodic tables that have, have occurred. Here's one called the, uh, it's an alternative. It's a circular circular one that kind of puts everything in a different perspective. It's kind of hard to read this one here, but uh, uh, there are some advantages, some disadvantages to a circular periodic table. Obviously I prefer the one we're used to, but uh, that's simply because I'm more familiar with it. Uh, there's alternative product tables that actually predict where the new elements, if they are are made, where where they should be and, and so forth. In fact, these guys right here, this product table predicts a whole series of elements over here yet to be discovered. It's pretty slick if that's, you know, this is true. And there's quite a bit of elements out there. As I stated before, we have on here 18 and they're, they're working to try to trying to find the other uh, more than 118 so maybe in years to come they will make it happen okay so there's one version of uh, another alternative version of the periodic table okay um now this we we talked earlier about the Niels Bohr, uh, Niels Bohr. he talked about the energy levels okay and so uh we have the block elements you know the first two blocks are the S, the D is just given as follows, the P block and then the F block. You, you notice here, um, the, I think I'm getting close, the D block, notice how the number start, starts with three for those. Remember, you take one away from its energy level, which is the fourth, and that becomes the D block. Down at the bottom, um, you subtract two, okay? So this is actually the, the six energy level, seven energy level. So it becomes the four F and the five F. All right, so we got the S block, the D blocks, P blocks, and the F blocks. All right, I tell you what, one I, I just realized is 215. Why don't I stop here? And on Thursday, we should knock this out. It's a very short table, uh, chapter on the product table. And uh, where are we? Page five. 